Well, listen, I want to thank y'all for coming out on this crazy cold day, but you know what? The Lord of glory is worthy of our praise. Amen. And look, I just got to tell you that I'm so excited about all of the different things. I'm getting testimony after testimony after testimony of God doing things in people's lives. You understand what I'm saying? And, and, the, and the, the most beautiful part about it is that a lot of these testimonials that I'm, what I'm hearing is that people, and look, it's people, well, I mean, when Bill gave his testimony and then somebody else recently shared with me, I'm not going to say nothing. I'm going to keep my eyes focused because I'm praying, but I've mentioned to a couple of different people because, and not just, not just the person I'm talking about, but I talked to somebody this morning too, about how God's just moving in, in situations and like a river of truth, just coming in and just like sweeping through and changing stuff. I'm talking about like spiritual deliverance taking place without a man laying hands on him. <laughs> you hear me? Just the truth, the spirit of truth coming in like a river whoo, and like changing stuff. Hallelujah. And look, that's a beautiful thing, friend. Okay, because look, that's how the power of the Holy Spirit can work in our hearts and lives. So we're not going to, we can't box God in and say deliverance looks like this. No, no, no. The Holy Spirit's the one that brings deliverance. Amen. And sometimes they use a man to lay hands on somebody. And some, but look, for believers, let me just tell you something. For believers, it has to do with the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth of us understanding what the truth of the word of God says. And then once we know that for us to move towards that truth, we have to understand that there's going to be a constant battle between the flesh that still wants to be tempted or can allow itself to be tempted by the things of the world that are contrary to the will of God. And that when we submit to the spirit of error, we open up the doorway for these things to come into our heart and our lives. That's not what I plan on preaching about this morning, but I want you to know that Jesus was sent to us because within him, within this baby that was born, was contained the spirit of truth. Born into a world that was filled with lies and darkness. Born into a world that man was hurting, that even the religious people of the world were actually holding God's people in bondage because it had become tradition and lies had been added to truth and the truth had been watered down and diluted and that the people were in the midst of darkness yet the light of God came into the midst of this darkened world amen and the truth of God hallelujah will heal you I want you to know that I'm having trouble with my little microphone this morning sorry about that but look this wasn't even part of my message but as I had seen Somebody, you know, come up to the front and then I was worshiping after I got up and I saw Kirk and Brennan and I was thinking about the, a couple of other people had come and knelt, kneeled at the altar. And I, all of a sudden, you know, and I know I'm, this isn't, I didn't come up with something like this, but I was thinking, the wise, wise men bow to him. And I looked at the scripture, and I mean, a few different scriptures showed up. I mean, translations, but let's just read the King James, Matthew chapter 2. Sandy, you can have, do you mind putting the, are the scriptures going to work today? Really? Okay. Well, can you put me on channel 2 maybe, and I'll try to take over? I don't know how I'll do this completely, but because I got my little notes in here. Y'all might just have to deal with me because I'm, huh? Okay. Yeah, cool. Well, so anyway, we'll mirror the screen because I'd like you to see some of these scriptures this morning, but I may have to, um, uh, yeah, I think maybe our internet's out. I don't know. Y'all got, y'all got Bibles? Some of y'all still tote paper Bibles? Something's going on. The internet's broken. We won't blame Cox this time. Maybe the frozen weather did it. Let's go ahead and be sweet to Cox because Lord knows. I've given them an earful a couple of times. Lord, forgive me. All right. So what we'll do is, if you got a Bible, I'll try to lead you and guide you down these paths. But look, in this particular scripture, in Matthew chapter 2, verse 11, in the King James Version of the Bible, it says this. It says, and when they were come into the house, talking about the wise men, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. I 
always preach about the gifts that oftentimes at some point in the Christmas season, you know, because of what they represent. But listen, I'm not even focused on that right now. I'm focused on the fact that they came and they bowed to the king. And one of the things that I want to just encourage y'all as the body of Christ that come and part of this congregation, that we really want this altar to be a place where people can be ministered to. And I want you to know that there's various reasons sometimes that people would maybe come to the altar. And one of the things, reasons that you would want to come to the altar is that you just want to love on Jesus. You want to just like, you want to just pour your heart out to him and you want him to minister to you. In the midst of that, maybe somebody will come lay hands on you. Maybe even somebody might have a word for you. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. But I want to just encourage you that to understand this, that just because somebody comes to the altar, and sometimes that may be the case. Listen, listen to me, 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 listen to me. Fall at your knees at the face in, in the presence of God. I'm just trying to make a point. That's a, that's that would be an important. Oh, well, I couldn't do that, pre- preacher. I, I definitely couldn't do that. Look, back in the day, let me tell you something. When I got saved, and again, I, let me not go on and on. I'm just saying it's not about me and whatever. But has moved into a very seeker sensitive environment where we and it what is done is is that it's helped protect things in our hearts that ought not be there yeah what I'm trying to say is is that hold on preacher slow it down take it down a notch let's not make the people feel uncomfortable but look no, we need to get uncomfortable. Whenever, listen, and this ain't got nothing to do with my message, but when King David brought the presence of God, when he brought the ark back into the city of Jerusalem, which is the city of peace, and every six steps, which is the number of man, an animal sacrifice had to be offered because man is fallen, but God has an answer that would ultimately be Jesus, the bread of heaven that would come to earth. And listen, the sacrifice, a trail of blood, like Ross preached so many years, years ago, leading the presence of God back into the city known as peace, which is Jerusalem, because you and I need peace in our life. But if we have strongholds of sin in our heart and in our life, and we're unwilling to submit them at the feet of Jesus, we will not experience the peace of God in our life. And we're going to sit here and we're going to wonder why, why, why? No, 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 no. We need to bow at the feet of Jesus. See, when I first got saved, there wasn't none of this, Lord, forgive me, I don't think it's a bad word, there wasn't none of this monkey shine going on. There wasn't none of this kind of stuff, worried about seeker sensitive and how we're going to make people feel. No, it was like you preach the truth and people respond. People respond not just to the preacher, but to the anointing of the Holy Spirit. They respond to the word of God because it pricks their heart. And they say, I need that. I need Jesus to touch me. I need Jesus to change me. So there may be times at the altar that that's what you're coming to do. And let me tell you something. Don't let that spirit of pride rise up in you. Oh, I couldn't do it. No, yes, you can do that. And as a matter of fact, you better do that. And if you don't want to do it at this altar, you better find an altar in your house. And you better bow. We better. I better bow my knee to the presence of the Lord. Let him come in like with that river and begin to cleanse and refresh. Do you believe what I'm telling you is true? I hope that I'm, pre- I'm speaking to people that believe in the truth. But there, there's the possibility that some people in here might, yeah, well, I believed in a little bit of what you said, but I don't know if I believe. Okay, I understand. You need to take what I'm telling you. You need to compare it to the Word of God, and you need to find out if I'm telling you the truth. And if I'm telling you the truth, we need to bow at the feet of Jesus. And so sometimes we'll come to the altar because we're desperate for God to do a work in our heart and our life. And listen, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, into the mighty hand of God, that in due time he may exalt you. Sometimes, look, the enemy, through a spirit of pride, whispering in our ear, oh, don't you go to that altar. Don't, why, why would he tell me not to go to the altar? Because he doesn't want me to receive the freedom that Jesus purchased for me when he died at the cross. Oh, but you can, and listen, and we can say, oh, yeah, but Jesus already did it at the cross. Oh, you think I don't know that? I've been preaching that for the last God knows how many years. 
But until we appropriate that truth or receive that truth, even for the very little elements in the intricacies in our heart, do you know that there's stuff hidden in us? Do you know that there are things hidden in us that try to hide in the darkness, in the deep recesses of our heart? I'm just trying to speak truth to you guys. That's what I love. Look, I... I'm starting to just love everybody. <laughs> Thank you. That's, you know, and that's the Holy Spirit. That ain't, that ain't me. Thank you, Jesus. I love you. And so that's why I want to tell the truth, you know, and I want it to come across as though I love you. And look, we can't, we need the Lord to be able to minister these things to our heart. Amen. So anyway, when we come to the altar, we may be coming just to bow down and worship the king. So just, I want y'all to understand that because y'all the family of God. And I want y'all to understand that we should be free to come to the altar. Don't let the devil lie to you while you're sitting in that chair. Any one of y'all can come to the altar to, to lay down and to bow down before your king. And guess what? When you start to, I, I said it. Waffle House, this, this is, but you know what? We need to just be real, right? We ain't got to have form and tradition, right? And so I can remember being at Waffle House after uh, Brother uh, Kirk and Sister Brenda had ministered and whenever my daughter got touched and I was asking her, well, sister, what did you say to her? And she just said, and I think that this is so, it's not, well, it is profound because like she, I never thought of it like that but it's at the same time it's very simple <laughs> she said she said she asked Sierra baby what what do you want from God and then Sierra said whatever she said okay take your lips and from your heart tell God what you want him to do and when she did boom okay now what I'm trying to say is is this each and every one of us have things in our heart and in our life that the Lord's speaking to us about. And I'm not saying you have to come to the altar. You can do business with the Lord anywhere that you want to. I'm just trying to give you an example that that's kind of what the concept of the altar is about. That we come to unload our burdens at the feet of the Lord. We come to work. Sometimes, sometimes we may have strongholds or things in our life that we're wanting to give over to the God. And in the spirit of humility, as we come and lay them down at the altar, the Lord is pleased by the spirit because he responds to humility. If he resists pride, he responds to humility and his grace flows into humility. And so there can be breakthroughs that take place. Amen. In that sense, it's not so much because you came where there was a seven inch ledge or however tall it is of a piece of wood covered by carpet. It's not that. It's the concept of what takes place when a person comes in humility to lay their life down before the king. Okay. And then sometimes again, there's this place of worship where I'm bowing down just to exalt him and to give him glory. And I don't know about you, but I'm kind of thinking like we probably all at some point in time, should be coming to the altar and bow down and give glory to the king. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Cool. All right. So what I wanted to talk to you about this morning is a couple of passages of scripture. And I guess, like I said, our little, uh, our, um, our system isn't really working too good today. We'll have to figure that out. But the name Emmanuel, y'all remember that out of Matthew, how it said, and call his name Emmanuel, which translated is God with us. Right, And so what I started to think about was, again, these connections that take place between the old, the old covenant and the new covenant. And I just get excited when I see these things. And I hope that in some way, maybe these concepts will minister to you too, but we'll try to bring it into our lives today. So going back to the Old Testament in the tabernacle, and y'all have heard me say this before, but in the, in the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 25, verse eight, because let's just imagine the world whenever God called Moses to prepare a place so that God could dwell or inhabit with his people. Again, we're talking about a world and a time frame whenever the world, <clears throat> again, has fallen into sin. We understand that, right? That at the garden, in the event that the serpent reared his head and injected humanity with the poison of sin, the poison of rebellion, and it results in any kind of a symptom that would prevent mankind from being able to move forward in the things of God, right? And so it just, sin by itself 
trespasses and sin and transgressions against God prevent us from being able to really access the presence of God the way that God, because God cannot inhabit, he cannot dwell with sin. And so God immediately begins a plan. But the point is, is that the world is filled with darkness. All of humanity has been tainted with this thing called sin. And so God begins the process of creating or preparing a people that would, that would serve him. Amen. And that would, or preparing a way that people could be connected to him, to have access to him. Because if we could just have access to the presence of God, if we could have access to the spirit of truth, if we could have access to the holiness of God, it'll begin to change us. It'll begin to change our situation and our circumstance. And so that's what God has been committed to through these thousands of years of human history. And so when we get to the place in the wilderness, whenever God's delivering his people from Egyptian bondage. And look, Egypt is a type of the world. The, the children are welcome to stay here today. They are not going to out-preach the preacher, I can promise you. So, But whatever, however y'all want to handle that. And so look, look, so the, the presence of God wants to move in. And so God takes his people because look, God is looking for a remnant on the earth. God is looking for a people on the earth Amen. That will serve him. That will know him. A people group that will know him. Amen. And, and, and that are willing to serve him. And so he has to introduce himself to them. All right. And so in the narrative of the Exodus, these are the people of God. They find themselves in slavery. God brings them out. He tells Moses, build me a sanctuary. Okay, thank you, Siri. We don't need you either because you ain't nothing but a distraction. Thank you very much. All this stupid technology, Lord, help us. So God has a plan, amen? And he says, Exodus chapter 25, verse 8, let them construct a sanctuary. Let them build a sanctuary for me. Why? So that I may dwell among them. God wants to dwell. He wants his presence to be among his people. Amen. And, and, and then, and so then in Exodus 25, 30, he says this, he says, you shall set the bread of the presence on the table before me at all times. Now I want to just take a little bit of time with this. When you walked into the sanctuary, look real quick, there was a bronze, there was a bronze altar. And this is where the animal sacrifice took place. And this is a type of the cross. And until you did business at the altar, there was no access even for the priest to go move forward and further into where the presence of God was dwelling. So you're not going to get into the presence of God until you do business at Calvary, right? You got to do business with the sacrifice in order to be cleansed of your sin, in order to be able to move forward into the things of God. And then there was the bronze laver, which is a type of the word because they could see themselves. But when you move into the holy place, the first little chamber, you had the menorah, which was the, can the lamp stand, and you had the incense. But over here to the right, you had the table of showbread. I want to focus on that. They called it show bread in the King James. They call it the bread of presence in many of the other translations. I want to stick with the bread of presence because I think who in the world knows even what show bread means. Do you know what show bread means? S-H-E-W bread. That ain't even an English word anymore. So let's just try to understand what the word's saying. It's saying the bread of the presence. Okay, and whenever you move into the curtain, but you can only do that one time a year and only the priest can do that, the high priest on the day of atonement. And it takes blood. He has to go once a, a year. So God is saying, but listen, I want my people to understand. And I, look, even only the priest once a week on the Sabbath could eat the bread of presence. So I, one of the things that I need you to understand is that God is always trying to remind his people with all of these things that we do, they're supposed to remind us of who we belong to. For the Old Testament people, we talked about it recently, the, the firstborn and how they would have to kill the firstborn animal. And it was a constant reminder that they served the God, that they belonged to the God that delivered them out of the world with his mighty hand. And they also the weekly Sabbath and then the yearly Passover and all of these things and even the circumcision. All of these things were to remind the children of Israel who they belonged to. God wants you and I to be reminded who we belong. Do we belong to, to Jesus today? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. It's a good question. It's a very, very important question. 
Who do we belong to? It's a question that we have to ask ourselves. It's a question that our children need to ask themselves. Because just because, I'm just saying, just because I have come to the conclusion that I'm a possession of God, that I belong to God, doesn't mean that my offspring have come to that conclusion for themselves. Lord knows I've done a lot of teaching. Lord knows I've done a lot of prayer. I need to do more prayer. And I'm going to believe God that they are going to come to that place or that they're moving further, further and further towards that place. But I'm just saying, like, for each and every one of us, we have, do I belong to God? Because if I do belong to God, if I am indeed his possession, if I have indeed been purchased by his blood, if I no longer am my own, but yet instead I've been purchased with a price, and that I am his possession, then that means that I am supposed to submit to his will. Amen? And so that bread of presence was a reminder because, you see, even the priest who represented the people of God could only go beyond the veil once a year, but once a week on the Sabbath, they would exchange the showbread or the bread of presence. So the bread of presence was a reminder, my presence is with my people. You built me a sanctuary so that my presence could dwell with my people. And now once a week, this bread of presence, which was actually six loaves, two rows of six loaves, six and six, 12, equaling the, the number of the tribes of Israel, the people of God. Okay. And on top of it, a little container of some frankincense, which is kind of interesting because the table was made out of gold frankincense was, was, okay, and what were the gifts that were given to Jesus? This just hit me that last night when I was reading. The gifts given to Jesus were gold. The table of showbread was made out of gold. Frankincense and myrrh. Well, then the frankincense would be taken and offered to God and burned on the altar. So if you've ever seen powdered type incense, then it's an interesting thing the way that it burns. It, it, bur it burns and it produces smoke and it can be very savory and aromatic whenever it burns, okay? But, but so that was a type of sacrifice, all right? And so, so that, 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 that part of it would be burned and then, and then what would happen is those priests would eat the bread in the presence of God in that little holy place and they would do that once a year and and if you go and you read the details of it the idea is it was very methodical like two there were if I'm not mistaken I'm kind of shooting from the hip here but I've studied it before and I've preached it before and what I remember is that there would be four priests two of them would remove what was already there that had been placed there a week ago and the other two would hurry up and stick the other two on there because he said the bread of presence would be before me always and then what would happen is, is that the, the priest together would eat the bread of presence in the presence of God. And it's a form of communion where they are engaging the presence of God and they're acknowledging that they belong to God and that this presence is even a type of communion way in advance that shows that the presence of God is coming to man, a reminder, a, a little thing in the word of God way back in the past to re show people like you and me, God was working on this way back then, right? And so that's what would happen. And, and let me just read it to you in Leviticus 24, 5 and 9. It says, then you shall take fine flour and bake 12 cakes with it. Two tenths of an ephah shall be in each cake you shall set them in two rows, six to a row, on the pure gold table before the Lord. You shall put pure frankincense on each row, that it may be a memorial portion for the bread. A memorial. He wants you to remember. He wants us to remember who we belong to. You know, it's not accidental that when Jesus ate the last supper or the last Passover, whatever you want to call it, with his disciples, he said, as often as you do this, you will do this in remembrance of me. It's a memorial. You're remembering Jesus. You're remembering his sacrifice. You're remembering also that he will return again. Amen. He says, on each row will be a memorial portion for the bread, even an offering by fire, talking about that frankincense, to the Lord. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually. It is an everlasting covenant for the sons of Israel. It shall be for Aaron and for his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place, for it is most holy to him from the Lord's offerings by fire, his portion forever. Listen. 
I want to just kind of say something, and I don't mean to be redundant, but I want to really burn this in the retina of your mind. That God does not want you, I know I've already said it, but I'm going to say it again. God does not want you to forget who you belong to. Because listen to me, there's a lot of communication on the outside. We can scroll through TikTok. We can scroll through social media, the world. Oh, you're picking on my, my I'm pick, yeah, I'm picking on your poison. That's exactly what I'm doing. I'm picking on your poison. The things that come from the world, the digital world that the, that the enemy has created, Somebody was sharing with me, and I really do hope we get to hear this. We, I, listen to me. This is so powerful, dude. Somebody was sharing with me their testimony. And I'm telling you, dude, this is a powerful testimony. But this person had been talking about the fact that they were caught up in a game. Call of Duty is what it was called, right? And I don't know. I haven't seen it. I'm taking the word for it. I've talked to a couple of other people. Yeah, dude, I did see it. I was telling another person at the clinic. He was like, well, yeah, that's just the software, Okay. But do you not think it's a problem, Christian, that every time you go to load the game up, it says, I think this is what it says, and prepare for demonware. <laughs> prepare for demonware. What? Oh, come on, preacher. You're out of control, man. You're so technical. Do you really think? Because listen, when I just said that, if something jumped up from your belly into your brain and irritated you, that ain't the Holy Spirit, my friend. That is a demon spirit that is trying to, let me, let me say that again, because there's a lot of, there can be distraction going on in the house of God. If when I said that about demonware, something jumped up from your belly and clinged to your brain and said, this preacher's crazy, that was not the Holy Spirit. That was a demonic spirit that's trying to irritate you. Number one, you're going to look at me frustrated because I said it, and you're not going to like me anymore, possibly. But number two, you're going to reject the truth that was just spoken that could possibly be part of the answer to the solution of the stronghold that has been in your life. Do you think the world loves you? Do you think the spirit, do you think it's accidental that they call their software demonware? Okay. It's not, but let's just move forward, okay? That's just one little symptom, and we'll keep moving forward as the days go forward, and we'll keep interjecting these things as needed, amen? I like the way that Robert used to say it, why you think they call alcohol spirits. <laughs> that was pretty good. Why? Come on. We're imbibing spirits. Lord, help us. All right. Let's keep moving right here. So look, the bread of presence. And listen, I want to just tell you this, that in John chapter 1, verse 14, where the scripture says, the word was made flesh, and the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we saw his glory. The glory cloud, if you will, represented the presence of God. Amen. Where it says he became flesh and dwelled amongst us, that very word, and I know I've said it many times, what does it mean? The word dwelled. What does it mean in the Greek? The word is literally sanctuary. Jesus, the word, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, amen. And all things, I'm paraphrasing, were created by his word. There was not anything that was created that not, was not created through the word. Then the word became flesh and dwelled amongst us. That word dwelled in the Greek language means sanctuary. The word became flesh and sanctuaried among us. The very tabernacle of God became flesh, the presence of God. Build me a tabernacle so that I might dwell with my people, put some bread in it so that we can have communion and that they remember who they belong to because there's coming a day when I'm going to send my son, my presence as the bread of life onto this earth and they will be able to have communion with me and my very presence will tabernacle or sanctuary with them. Oh, it's a good plan, my friend. God's presence wants to sanctuary with us. Oh, did you not know that ye are the temple of God? What fellowship does light have with darkness? What fellowship does, does the spirit of God have with Belial, another name for the enemy? There's no fellowship between light and darkness. Help us. 
You now have become the temple of God. Well, how did that happen? Because the very presence of God that was represented in the tabernacle on the mercy seat when the blood was applied, he said, I will meet with you between the cherubim and the very presence of God represented in the showbread that was eaten every other week and the very presence of God that showed up in sanctuary with us when he died on the cross, hallelujah. He promised that the comforter would come and when you and I bow our knee, to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, what happens? The Holy Spirit rushes in. He makes the presence of God a home on the inside of our heart. And the whole nativity story is birthed, not in a manger, in a stable, but in a heart. Amen. And it keeps happening. Praise God. And so in that sense, Matthew 1 and 23, he said, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Amen? That's a good word. Amen? God with us. Praise God. God, God is with us. Do you know the privilege that we have? I mean, just sometime today, let's just think about that, the privilege that we have. And, and listen, when I say this, how many times I know many of you have engaged. I mean, I'm just looking around this room and there might just be really less people that have not tried to talk about Jesus than people that have tried to talk about Jesus to other individuals. Because I know most of you personally, okay? And I know that many of you, the majority have at some point engaged in conversation about Jesus. And along the way, you have seen some people that their eyes light up and they're like, man, there's something about that. You know, they're receiving it. And then there's probably been times, if it's been anything like in my life, where they're like basically going to sleep. They're looking off into the corner over there. They're doing this over here. Oh my gosh, when's this guy gonna stop? Okay, you know. But, but, but instead of being like, it's really, we should be sorrowful, but think about the privilege you have because you were one of those who your eyes got big and you received that truth into yourself. And now look how far you've come. I'm just saying you have access to God. You understand about the presence of God, at least to some extent you have, you know him. What a privilege to know him. We do believe that he's real. We wouldn't be here on Christmas in freezing cold weather when I got my, my unfortunately, my pipe didn't make it through, but we're going to figure it out. But, but nevertheless, we made it here because, because it's important to us, amen, to give glory to our king, right? And so I just wanted you to know. Now, now with that said, I'm going to shift for a second away from the bread to deliverance. Because, you know, when, when, when Angie preached a little while back, when she preached on the Exodus chapter one account, I went back and I, I was, she told me, I said, you ready for, you bringing some fire, girl? And she said, yeah, I'm preaching on Exodus one. And so I was in triage and I was seeing these patients, but I got a little break. I said, let me go back and read Exodus one. I was like, oh man, look at that. Look at that story. When the children of Israel began to multiply and they began to gain strength, what happens? The enemy does not want to see the people of God gaining spiritual strength strength. Come on, somebody. We're talking about a type here. This is something that continues to live on today. When the enemy of God begins to see you moving in the power and the authority and the anointing of God, I promise you he's going to send something your way to try to kill the move of God in your life. And it's high time that the people of God start to recognize the tactics of the enemy and the enemy's plan to destroy the work that God wants to do on the inside of our heart in our lives. And so what did Pharaoh say? He told those midwives, he said, listen, if it's a boy, I want you to kill it. If it's a girl. So look, if you'll remember the story, what ends up happening in the story is that God says, I'm going to kill Pharaoh's firstborn because he's messing with my firstborn because Israel is my firstborn. And so he said, I'm going to, I'm going to, this is what the judgment was. And look, God was merciful and sent the plagues, but Pharaoh hardened his heart, right? And through that, God hardened his heart, right? Hardened Pharaoh's heart. And, and then, and then the next thing you know, God brings the Passover. And what does he do? In the midst of this, look, I want you to see this, this type, this is powerful. 
in the midst of persecution, could we at least say that typologically Pharaoh is a type of antichrist? What I'm trying to say is antichrist, a vessel of the enemy trying to destroy God's people. I think we can at least say that Pharaoh would be a type of that and that he's trying to destroy the people of God. What happens whenever Pharaoh, the type of the Antichrist, tries to destroy the people of God? God delivers them through the blood of a lamb. All right? So then we take the story. So and where was the place that they were delivered out of? Egypt. God delivered his firstborn out of Egypt and made them a nation. And through that nation, he gave the world, Jesus. Amen. So in Exodus 4, well, let's just go ahead and read a little bit of the story. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrews. This is Exodus 1, 15 and 16. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other was Pua. And he said, when you are helping the Hebrew women to give birth and see them upon the birth stool, if it is a son, then you shall put him to death. But if it's a daughter, he shall live. And they said, listen, man, these Hebrew women are different than the Egyptian women. They strong. They, they don't need us. They won't call us. Okay. And then in Exodus 4:22 through 23, then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I said to you, let my son go that he may serve me, but you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. And so we see this type of antichrist or a vessel of the enemy at the very least trying to destroy the people of God. And whenever the enemy of God tries to destroy the people of God, God delivers them through the blood of a lamb. When I see the blood painted on your doorpost and your side post, my judgment will pass over you and you will be delivered out. So God delivered his firstborn out of Egypt, a type of the world that was under the influence of a type of the enemy trying to hold God's people in bondage. Why? You remember what God told him? Let my people go. Why did God want his people to be let go? So that they can worship me. Oh, come on, somebody. And now listen, the bondages that the enemy tries to place in our heart and in our lives, his purpose is to try to prevent us from worshiping God. And the truth of the gospel teaches that the blood of the lamb that was shed on the cross delivers us. He has translated us from the kingdom, Egypt, the world, into the kingdom of his dear son. We're living in a new environment, my friend. We're living in a new atmosphere. And I mean, I don't know. We could call it a bubble. This place. We could, and we could just all walk together and carry this building around with us just to show it as an illustration. It doesn't have nothing to do with the building. We're just all walking around collectively kind of like in a bubble. Oh, that's weird. I don't like that. Okay, well, do you not agree with me? That you were born in sin, born of Adam, born in the midst of the world, and that when you put your faith in Christ, the old man that you were born under the sin and the power of sin in Adam has died in Christ. A new man has been resurrected, and through that process, you've been translated from the kingdom of darkness, Egypt, the world, into the kingdom of his dear son, into the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom of God, what's ruling and reigning? Not the power of sin, the grace of God. The grace and the power of God. This is the word of God, my friend. The word of God says you and I have power over serpents and scorpions. The word of God says you and I have power over the demonic. You're, the word of God says you and I can walk in victory over the power of sin. Hallelujah. It's about us believing what the word of God says. The word of God. Oh, but preacher, you don't know what I deal with. Oh, come on, preacher. You don't know. I mean, look, I'm not trying to get weird on you, but you don't know what Uncle such and such did when I was five. I know that that gets ugly. Don't be poking around too much, preacher. No, that's exactly what we need to do. Because sometimes those little time frames are exactly when the enemy first entered in and caused strongholds to take place. But I'm here to tell you right now, there's no assault on the human heart 
that is greater. There's no demon spirit that is greater. There is no addiction. That, oh, they didn't have heroin back then. They didn't have crack cocaine. I don't care what the devil comes up with. There's nothing more powerful than the power of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. It's the power of the Holy Ghost that's working in our hearts and our lives. He's coming in like a river and he's setting us free. He's washing and he's cleansing and he can because of the blood of the Lamb. And my faith in that says, Lord, I realize it's not my righteousness. I am unworthy, but I need you to work in my heart and in my life. Thank you for shedding your blood. And I believe that was enough. It is finished, he said. Hallelujah. You and I can start to trust in the plan of God. But because you refuse, Pharaoh, I'm going to kill your son, your firstborn. And then we fast forward to New Testament time, and what do we see? Herod slaughters the babies. Are you think this is accidental? Another type of antichrist. Concerned that his kingship is going to be removed. I mean, come on, think of it. Do I have to plug it? Y'all are smart enough. I can see some of y'all is clicking. The devil his kingship. He wants to be king of this earth. He wants to usurp the authority of God. He starts in your life. He starts in individual lives. And then he takes these individuals and he usurps the power of governments. He, 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 he wheedles his way into governments and politics. And he wheedles his way into the music industry. And he wheedles his way into Hollywood. And he wheedles his way any way that he can to inject the lies his lies to bring confusion into the heart and minds of God's people. Matthew chapter two, verses 16 through 19. Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, so where were they? Where did the Holy Spirit tell Joseph to go? When Herod began to want to kill the babies, he brought them back to Egypt. That's an amazing thing that just hit me the other day when we were praying in our house for our little Christmas get together last week. We, we done had so many Christmases. And look, I'm just gonna be honest with you. I hope Naya's watching. Can we give that production, all of y'all that were involved, I'm telling you right now, listen. That was a communication of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I was, compl I was blown away by the way that it all just flowed, okay? And look, I know that God was behind it, so thank you, Naya, for that. But look, when, and so I've had so many Christmases already, you know, that it's just, I mean, Christmas celebrations. And, but while we were there, I was thinking about Angie's message. And I was thinking about Herod killing the babies, and I was thinking about the fact that God delivered his firstborn son, Israel, out of Egypt, which is a type of the world. And then when he delivered his firstborn son, the bread of presence, into the earth, he sent him back to Egypt whenever the other type of Antichrist was breathing threats to kill the babies. And I started to realize, because God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but instead could have everlasting life. So God delivered Israel out of the world so that he could give the world Jesus. And then when he gives the world Jesus, what was the purpose of Jesus? To bring deliverance to the world. So it's a type. And Jesus is bringing deliverance to the world. How? The same way the Passover lamb brought it. Through the shedding of righteous blood, God's judgment will pass over the people of God. And it, judgment is going to rest or find itself laid upon the people of the world. And so God is in the midst of doing this beautiful work. So in this, 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 so in children, he brings the presence, Emmanuel, God with us. He brings Emmanuel to earth. Herod wants to kill the children. God sends his 
true firstborn Jesus back to the world. Amen. And when we take communion, like those priests did, we're repre it represents his presence. We were instructed by him to do this until he returns because we're recognizing that he is the very bread of presence that was sent by God. And that when we engage in this, we're remembering his sacrifice. We're remembering the fact that he forgave us of our sin. We're remembering the fact that he said he's coming back again. And this is another way for us to remember we are the people of God. And God so loved the world. Amen. So just again, Pharaoh tried to destroy God's firstborn Israel. What did God do? Deliverance. Herod tried to kill. Now this is about to get, I'm about to get a little bit of eschatological on you. Oh, that's a fancy preaching word. Theological word. Why are you want to use big old words? Eschatology just means the study of end time events. That's all it means. So we're talking about the end. I'm going to, well, but this is the beginning of the new birth. Yep. And we're going to carry it through to the end too in this little message right here because I'm about to close it out for you. Pharaoh tried to destroy God's firstborn Israel. What did God do? Deliverance. Okay. Deliverance. How? Through the shed blood of a lamb. How many times have I preached to you the same way Look, just real quick. What is it? Is it is it Psalm 53 where David writes the psalm after his sin with Bathsheba? And what does he say? Purge me with hyssop. A lot of times people don't realize, but hyssop was a plant. Solomon taught about it. It would grow out of the cracks in the in the walls. It was a it was an absorbent type plant. When they applied the blood on the doorpost and the side post, guess what they used? hyssop. They dipped it in the blood. Now, you think that that's not what David was talking about? You think David, King David, did not understand as a young Jewish boy learning the, the scriptures since his childhood that he did not understand that hyssop was used to paint the doorpost? You think that Israel was not reminded that God delivered them out on the Passover night after all the things that we've talked about, 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 that we've delivered us from his mighty hand from Egyptian bondage. Purge us with his sup, Lord. So he said, purge me with his sup. He's calling back to the Passover event. He Listen, at a time frame when there did not seem to be any grace, he calls out for the grace of God. He says, I am a sinner. Purge me with his sup so that I shall be clean. Wash me and make me whiter than snow. So the hyssop, and listen, they, they dipped the hyssop and they tried to give it to Jesus while he was on the cross in the little wine and, and whatnot in the, in the vinegar. But look, Herod tried to kill God's firstborn Jesus. What did God do? He sent Jesus back to Egypt because God judged Egypt with plagues, but God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. So he delivered Israel out of the world. But look, he's like, I didn't forget you over there, Egypt. I didn't forget you over there, world. I'm sending my son, the presence, the bread of presence back to the world because I've come to deliver the world because I so love the world that I'm going to send my only begotten son. And whoever is willing to believe that will not perish but have everlasting life. But my friends think I'm crazy. Yeah, but who's the crazy one? Is the word of God true or is it a lie? Is God true or is he a liar? If God is true, let every man be a liar. If God is true, let his word speak its truth. If God is true, let the spirit of truth speak to your heart and let it have its way on the inside of us. I'm closing with this end time eschatology. It's just a thought. If God delivered, if Pharaoh wanted to kill God's firstborn Israel and God delivered them out from underneath that bondage. And then if Pharaoh wanted to kill his true firstborn Jesus, but delivered him by sending him back to Egypt so that the world could then be delivered once he would die on the cross. 
And if for thousands of years of human history, the gospel message has been going forth and people's lives have been changed and that they now become the born again of God through faith in the firstborn. And he said in John chapter one, that I have given them the power to be called the sons of God because they believed on the one whom God sent. Is the real antichrist? Who is he going to persecute? It's just a thought. Will he only persecute the world? I'm not even going to talk about all this right now. I'm trying to make a point. You do what you want with it. You take it home. Don't, don't shut me down. You better go put, you better get in the word, my friend. You better get in the word and listen to me. I'm going to say it real sweet, but I'm going to say it real, real. You better not, I don't care how much you love a man, only receive and listen to the words of a man. There's been many a men that I know that God spoke through and showed me, like even going back to the purpose-driven lie. The Lord said, as I was regurgitating the words of another man that was coming against the purpose-driven lie, God said, you better go buy the book for yourself, read it for yourself, compare it to my word before you just start regurgitating the same words that another man is speaking. You got scripture to tell me to do that? Yes, sir, I do. Those of Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Why? Because they went home after the mighty apostle Paul. Paul spoke words of truth to them. And what did they do? They went back to the scriptures and they compared the scriptures to what they were being told. Yeah. Now, if the Bereans have to do that with the apostle Paul's message, you better be doing that with my message, friend. And you better also be doing it with the ones that I've received my message from to begin with. Because let me just tell you something. You better compare what you're being taught to the word of God. Amen. Now, with that being said, I've made my point. I'm going to say this. If Pharaoh, a type of antichrist, oh, but I can't even buy that. Okay, well then don't. Let's just take a nap for a second. I'm not trying to be rude. Lord, forgive me. Help my spirit. I, I say it because I love you. Right? Do y'all know that by now? Y'all know that, I, I mean, yes, am I an antagonistic person? Yes, Lord, change me. I'm not trying to be antagonistic. I do these things because I love people. I don't want us to be hoodwinked. Yeah. I don't want us to be tricky trick. I don't want us to be caught under the deception and the subtility of the evil one. He's very slick and tricky. And we cannot, okay. So if, who did Pharaoh persecute? The people of God. What did God do? He delivered them in the midst of the persecution. They had to go through the plagues, did they not? Fast forwarding to the time of Jesus, who did Herod persecute? The child of God. The people of God who had offspring at that time, what happened to their children? They died. So my question is, in the end, who is the enemy going to persecute? And I just want you to plug that in. It's for you to figure out for yourself. Okay, but what is God going to do for his people? He's going to deliver them. Those that have, now, you, you do what you want with the timing and all that stuff. I'm just trying to make a point. But what is the point I'm trying to make? If the children of Israel had to experience some of the plagues, is it possible that the people of God may have to experience some major tribulous times? Listen, more than anything about timing, I didn't even plan on doing this. This hit me last night. So this is where, this is where I'm coming with all this. But if the people of God had to experience tribulous times, then do we think that we may not have to experience tribulous times in the end. And I would just say this like that is that even if we don't end up in the end agreeing on timing of raptures and things of that nature, I'm okay. I'm a big boy. I don't need everybody to believe what I believe, but I do need as a pastor to communicate the things that I believe God is showing me, even when it's uncomfortable. And I know that it may not always be received, but if this is the case, if the scripture, what does the scripture say? What, that's what you got it. That's what not listen to me. Not what a not what another person, no matter how much you we respect him, says. That's not what I'm asking. What does the scripture say? Are we taking the because look, more than anything on timing of rapture, because that I want to break down the, the, the stronghold. 
you know, that would say that the American gospel or that because we're living in America, <laughs> that, we may, that we'll never have to worry about facing tribulation. Dude, do you realize how ridiculous that is? I've heard people say, yeah, but there's a bunch of Christians in America. You think they got Christians in other countries? You think they don't have uh, Christians in other countries that have more faith than you and I do? You think the apostle Paul didn't have faith when, before Nero cut his head off? <laughs> you think Peter didn't have faith before they hung him upside down on the cross? You think, you get the point. Well, why would God allow such a thing to happen to these mighty, mighty men of God? If it wasn't possible for these things to happen to mighty, mighty men of God. Well, why would you preach such a message on Christmas Day? Because the good news is that he sent the bread of presents. He sent the bread of presents to be with us so that we could have communion with him so that no matter what we face on this earth, no, no, no persecution. What does Romans 8 say? I am convinced that no angel, no, he, he goes through a whole litany of things, not trial, not tribulation, not even angels can keep us from the plan of God, from the presence of God. No matter what you and I may face, God gave us a gift. And the gift packaged up in those swaddling clothes was his son. But the gift of that presence will get us through, my friend. We need to hold on to the spirit of truth. And we need to let the spirit of truth prepare our hearts for what God desires to do. Amen. Singers, musicians, if y'all could come. We're going to go ahead and be prepared. Listen, I just want to say a couple of things about communion. This is the bread of presence. It's a reminder. It's a memorial. Jesus said, as often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. This bread of presence represents the sinless life of Jesus. The bread of presence represents the sinless life of Jesus. And in the Old Testament, the bread was unleavened. Leaven representing sin, yeast. Yeast is a representation of sin. There was no sin in Jesus. That's why when he died on the cross... God was able to accept his sacrifice because he was without sin and he paid the wage of sin, which is death. Amen. The blood represents the cross. The fact that he shed his blood for our sin. Amen. In the Corinthian passage, I'm not really going to read it to you, but Paul said in the night that the Lord was crucified, I received the same. And he quotes that, that last supper, that last Passover meal. But what he's doing is he's using it to explain to the Corinthian church that they've been doing things improperly. There's the possibility that even in a church like this, we may do things improperly if we're not careful. What we don't want to do is do things improperly with communion because the Bible says that sometimes the people of God can be sick if they're not doing it properly. It says if you've got to rightly discern the Lord's body. Now, I will tell you this, that I'm going to say a couple of things real quick. Number one, to rightly, he says in there, you take the Lord's supper unworthily. Now, the word unworthily is actually an adverb. It's describing the action. Now, what he was telling the Corinthian church was that the rich folk were coming first, eating all the bread, drinking all the wine, and then the poorer folk were coming in afterwards and there was nothing left for them. And he's rebuking the Corinthian church. Remember, that's the church that had all the gifts. But anyway, let's just leave it like that. He was rebuking the Corinthian church because of the way they were treating their brothers and sisters. And, and he says, you're, 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 you're not discerning the Lord's body. This isn't cracker and juice time, my friend. This isn't like a little, uh, Lord, forgive me, I want to be reverent, but this isn't like a little nibble and, and toss back a little, a little sip of juice. What we're doing when we're rightly discerning the Lord's body is we're remembering and we're recognizing the severity of sin. We're remembering and we're recognizing the cost that was paid to redeem us from our sin. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that he sent the presence of God into this wicked, darkened world. Amen. And at the same time, 
we have to also examine ourselves. The word wasn't unworthy. If you're a believer and you're born again and the Holy Spirit lives in you, you are worthy. You've been made worthy by the blood of the Lamb. That's one of the reasons we take communion to remind ourselves that he made us worthy. But whenever we're taking it, we also need to examine our own hearts. Because can I tell you this, that even us that understand the New Testament message, if we're going to call it the message of the cross, if we're not careful, you know what we will do? We will do the very thing the Apostle Paul warned the Romans about. He said that we would continue in sin so that grace may abound. We will forget the severity of sin. We will, when we start to understand justification by faith and understand that God has declared us innocent and righteous based upon the sacrifice of Jesus, and we start to realize that it's not about our righteousness, but instead it's about Jesus's righteousness. If we're not careful, we will start, living, we, we will start thinking we can just have all this liberty and, 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 and we, will, we can allow liberty to open the door. The devil ain't playing games, my friend. He will take any opportunity he can get to come in. So what is my point? My point is, my point is this, is that, <laughs> my point is this, is that the Holy Spirit wants to communicate truth to us. And this is the truth. We have freedom and victory over the power of sin through faith in Christ. The problem that we run into is kind of like what Robert used to say when the Lord said, wash the feet. Peter said, oh no, wash the whole thing. No, 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 you've been made clean. The word of God has made you clean. The truth of the word saves us and makes us clean. But when we're navigating this dirty world and we're walking upon this dirty world, sometimes our feet get dirty. Sometimes there's things that we don't even realize that we have allowed to enter in. And look, what we got to do is we got to at least examine our hearts and we got to bring those things that we know that the Lord has been dealing with our heart about and bring it before the Lord. So in these next few moments as they're worshiping the Lord and they're singing, I'm just asking you, you to examine your own heart and to pour your own heart out towards the Lord and to ask, for, you know, repent, ask the Lord to help our minds and our hearts so that we would connect to the truth of God's word and that we would believe that what we're remembering right here has set us free, that his sacrifice has set us free. And that if we will continue to keep faith in that the Holy Spirit's going to give us victory. It's the Holy Spirit that's going to give us victory. Amen? So look, as they're worshiping, you do, we're going to do business with the Lord. And when you're ready, you're going to take the bread. And when you're ready, you'll drink the cup. But examine your heart and allow the Lord to do a work in us. Amen? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus.